This is Dave Anthony from 10 Ton Mojo, and you are listening to the Brutally Delicious Podcast. Oh, nice. Hello. Dave, how are you? We're doing, guys. Good. How are you? Not too bad. How are you doing today? Thanks for joining us. I'm Bruce. That's my partner, Chris. How are we doing, Bruce? This is Dave Anthony here from 10 Ton Mojo. And how are you, Chris? I'm doing good. Where the hell are you? Yeah. I'm on Long Island right now. I'm the only member of the band from Long Island. Wait, wait, wait. Where on Long Island? I'm um, currently in Copaig, New York. Oh, okay. I'm originally, from, I'm, I'm originally from Limbrook and Valley Stream. Oh, shit, no way. Right, right off the Sunrise I'm Highway. Allowed there. I'm allowed to curse on this radio? I yeah, absolutely. Up already. All right, cool. <laughs> yeah, right along Sunrise Highway there. Nice. Yeah, I used to live in Rockville Center, so I wouldn't have been too oh, far yeah. from you Next for a little longer. I'm right. going through a divorce right now, so I've lived a lot of places. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> Don't be at all. Don't be. <laughs> all right. Well, Life anyway. is much better. Good. Chris, you want to jump in? You want me to take the lead? No, I have a question. When I think of New York City, I don't think of Southern Rock. How do these two things combine? Where, where does this begin? Um, I, I guess it kind of began with um some of the, uh, I guess, the newer additions to Ten Ton Mojo, like myself and uh, Christian, and uh, I guess a little bit of Kenny as well. Um, you know, Christian and I definitely have a, a, other, a heavy Southern Rock influence as far as our music. Um, we just i guess liked it you know we have a lot of family i guess down south as well uh but we both grew up i mean christian grew up in new york city i grew up on long Island, uh, and i've lived a couple places in the country but i've never really lived far down south i just feel like that is american rock and roll to me um the original classic rock that was american rock and roll was really the heavy stuff was from the south um you had very little from the north you know a little chicago blues some some out west like you know the doors and whatnot but um you you really your heaviest influences were really from the south and then from england um those, those were really your your biggest bands in, in my opinion i mean that were really coming out and showing showing heavy force not to mention the allman brothers always come play the beacon theater on my birthday around march 23rd so that hasn't hurt either. <laughs> so like why why do you think because I've I've noticed a trend of Southern rock really becoming like coming back into the mainstream. Why is that happening? Do you think? Because it's damn good music. I mean, that's <laughs> the only reason I can say I, it's. You know, I love slide. I'll say you know I love hearing that slide again. You know, it's like maybe different usage of guitar that you don't hear as much. I know guitar has been getting kind of crapped on a lot in music lately. Maybe it's not being as versatile used, and maybe it's kind of coming back to that sense. Um, but. Uh, there's, you know, it's it's a easy listening. I know country is kind of big, so maybe on the rock end, that's trying to bring um, rock back into it because rock has had better days in the past than it has recently, and uh, also part of our mission as well is to bring that back. Nice. I, I'm all for rock coming back to the mainstream. Trust me. But I'll say this: I don't think it's not mainstream because I think it's getting more listens than any other genre out there. Personally, Fair. I, I just don't I think, think it's in the radio or in the news as much as it used to be. Well, I guess that's, you know, part of, I guess, the mainstream is what I'm talking about. I guess it's not as, um, it's not Taylor Swift is what I'm yeah, saying, I guess. Thankfully. Um, you, you have basically the only one I could really think of that's on the, you know, you, you got some big bands out there like your Greta Van Fleets and stuff, but you're not hearing about them on the main level like you would, uh, Foo Fighters, I guess, would be kind of your like one rock band that is holding it down on the main pop level. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. <laughs> other than that, I don't really hear it thrown around. In fact, you're getting artists that aren't rock and roll put into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It's almost like it's being covered up. Um, I know a lot of hip hop artists would also take guitar players and make them ghostwrite so that, you know, you're just almost like eliminating the scene. And it, it, to me, it felt like it was being tried to be like quietly erased. Um, and I do feel like there is a resurgence coming back and I'm extremely happy about that. <laughs> yeah, me too. I've, I've just noticed it a lot more. Like uh, yesterday I was driving uh, to get my car fixed fun and um, uh, Kings of Leon song came on. And I was just like, man, this guy's voice has an emotion to it that you just, you don't really get that in pop music. Do you know what I mean? And I know Kings of Leon, 
might be considered pop music, but they're a rock band, you know? Oh, definitely. And I, I thought they were going to go a little pop for a minute. Um, I was kind of disappointed they didn't, um, but, you know. Yeah, but that voice, right? And then, then I started thinking about, like, why why has this gone away? And then today we're interviewing bands and I'm realizing, shit, there's a lot of people out there doing this and I need to know about them. <laughs> no argument. There still are a lot of us. We're just not we're just not as uh, put out there in the mainstream as much, but we're still <laughs> out there and there's a lot of great ones. Um, you know, one of my favorite things about. Oh. That playing music is I get so to play. How do you, how do you for- break through the barrier? Right? How do you break through and get to the mainstream? I mean, isn't that the age-old question? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it's tough. It's very tough. Um, I, I'd say, um, you know, multiple means. I guess you know, on the grassroots level, you want to make sure as a musician that you're hanging out after shows, you're mingling with fans, you're creating new fans, you're being, um, you're creating some link. You know, you want to create, um, you know, some some sort of not just hey, I like the music, but hey, I know this guy a little bit. And, you know, and you know. I mean, I, I like being social. I know a lot of musicians don't. I guess maybe that helps me on that end. But I, it's to me, that's why I'm there. I'm there for the fans. I'm, I'm an entertainer. Um, you know, as much as I love the music that I'm writing, I'm also there to share that music with other people. So I'd like that to be something that is, I guess, appreciated not just by myself, but also by the people off stage. So, that, you know, my feeling is you want to create that connection. I think on the grassroots level, that's a really important thing, especially in the beginning when you're starting off. That's a really important. Um, but as things get, you know, bigger, the, the game changes and it really changes on every stage kind of going up and you kind of have to adjust. Um, you know, sometimes money will make money as well. You have to sometimes invest this into some things that are helpful for you. And at the same time, sometimes you need to adjust. Um, you know, the, the story that was written before is not always the story that is now. So what worked then doesn't always work now. And the industry is changing vastly. And almost every day, uh, the labels used to own buildings and now they rent floors. So, you know, you got to kind of be your own manager. You kind of run your own business. Whereas before you kind of waited for some guy to like, see you and be this magical trip, take you off to some label. Um, you got to put a little more work into it nowadays, you know, run your business, um, which is, you know, sometimes frustrating, but sometimes awesome because you have a lot more control. Absolutely. Control, I'm going to go back to my first statement. How does Southern Rock end up in New York City? And I, I just started thinking about this, and it just hit me. I just finished watching a documentary on the band. It, the documentary is more on Robbie Robertson. Um, but that's a New York-based project, really. I mean, it's a couple Canadians mixed with a couple New Yorkers, and off they went, right? They became... One of the most infamous bands in history that really was a Southern rock band from New York. Say Le- Levon Helm's still buried in New York. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, imagine Bob Dylan coming to you. Hey, be my band. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> what would you do? For real. Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, I think I would go for it, but <laughs> yeah. you have to, I think. Yeah. yeah. So I, I just, just, I might, I might be like, hey, Bob, you want me to want to let me take the vocals? Like, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you just play the harmonica. Yeah, you give me the vocal melodies. You do great songwriting. Just, just you know, <laughs> let me sing it. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I, I actually saw Kings of Leon open for Bob Dylan quite a few years back. Wow, that must that, have been awesome. It well, the Kings of Leon were great, but then Bob Dylan came on. He did a country set, and I was just like, "This is not what I was expecting." Yeah, he's he's a little like Neil Young. He doesn't always give you the the mainstream stuff that he plays. He's um he's he's a true artist in a sense, I guess, on that respect. But as an entertainer, and maybe not so much. Right. Yeah, he's always trying to just piss you off. I think really. Yeah, that's he's his like, thing. Yeah. He's got that Yoko Ono thing. If half the, my audience doesn't leave, I didn't do my job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nice. Sorry. She actually that's said that Yoko one. Ono. I was like, ah, you know, I mean, different kind of art, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> that was that was my Yoko Ono impression. That was very good too. <laughs> yeah, anyways, I was gonna say if it's off key, I dig. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you know, she's how in a, the world, accomplished artist in her own right. How in the world did you get a hold of Max Norman to do this record? Oh man, uh, Max Norman was definitely an ace in the hole for this. Um, he was actually through a, a few connections, actually. Um, Scott 
actually was the one the, the Scott uh, Scott Lano in our band brought him to the table, um, and he was uh, I mean just. It, we kind of showed him what was up and he, he, he dug it. You know, I mean, I guess there's not, I mean, he's, he's always, you know, he's always got work, but I guess there's not a lot of new bands that are up and coming that are able to kind of contract his work. And he was kind of happy to work with us and we were happy to work with him. And it was, uh, it was a match made in heaven on that one. And, um, just had a nice studio to go to and everything really worked <laughs> on that one. I got to say, that one kind of fell in our laps a little bit. It was great. Was it intimidating <laughs> at all? Um, I got to say no. I mean, you know, hearing about it maybe at first, but um working with him. I mean, he's a great guy. He's very easy, chill, chill human being. I mean, uh it's probably one of the easiest human beings I've ever had to work with. I've had producers that are far less name recognized and you know, I, I would be like, "Wow, you know, I can't. I'm not really sure what's going on here." But he he was great. He was very easy to work with and he's got great ideas. He's not he's not overbearing. Doesn't make you feel like, you know, you're you know, you're losing any part of your, your baby, I guess. And, um, right. yeah, I, I thought it was very, very important, but tasteful. Like, I didn't feel like anything was changed to the point where I was like, Oh my God. But it was like, it was, it was important. It was like little subtle differences that were just fantastic. You know? Nice. I think that's what makes a great producer. Don't you like a producer that comes in and empowers the band to be the best version of themselves. 100%. That's, well, that's kind of what then, you just described to me. It is. And this is why this guy is, has the name that he does. You know what I'm saying? He's, he, he does that. You know, I, I can, you know, just like you're repeating what I said. Absolutely. That's, that's true. Nice. <laughs> so what rebel heart and gypsy soul came out about a month ago. What's been the response to it so far? Uh, I mean, I, I gotta say, I was just talking to my friend uh, from Jersey um, on the phone in my car earlier. And I, I'm, I'm just flabbergasted about how well it's doing. I mean, I, you know, I, I got to say, you know, as a, a personal, I guess, um, not to toot my own horn thing. I think it's overdue, you know, <laughs> but at the same time, I, I, I really have to be humbled about it. it. It's, you know, and honestly, I can't, I can't even believe how many hits we've been getting. It's, we're, we're, I think we're averaging about a thousand, uh, over a thousand streams and followers every day now, which is just, you know, it's awesome. And, and thank you everybody who's listening. I mean, we really appreciate that support, but it's been going fantastic. Um, what are you going to do with all the millions you get from those hits every day? Yeah. I don't, I don't know about <laughs> millions, but I mean, you know, ni nice to be making a decent <laughs> amount of royalties, but right. um, I guess at this point, you know, we're, we're looking to reinvest for the, for the most part, but I, I wouldn't mind getting a nice, a nice house somewhere in Jersey or PA or something like right. that. that. That might be something I'm looking in there, but, but yeah. <laughs> um, It'd be nice. It'd be nice to be able to lay on the fruits of a, the success of purely just music for a while. That'd be great. Yeah. Greetings from Evergreen Podcasts. We're rolling out a listener survey, and we want to hear from you. The information in the survey will help us gather statistics, and in turn, make our shows more appealing to advertisers. I know most people don't like ads, but this is one of the only ways our shows make money and help keep their lights on. We promise it will only take a few minutes, but the impact on our podcasts will be tremendous. As a token of our appreciation, we'll randomly select one lucky participant each month to win an exclusive merchandise package from Evergreen Podcasts. Head to evergreenpodcast.com slash listener survey to help a show and possibly get some free stuff for doing so. We can't thank you enough for the support. Now back to the show. Isn't that the dream? I think it's a dream of all of us, right? It it's an ebb and flow kind of dream, in my opinion. I've lived it, and I've also lost. It, it's just kind of you know when things are good, and in previous bands I've had it. Um, I mean, I I remember a time in my life where I, I literally didn't have a place to live, and I was just living out of my car because I knew I could afford everything in my life and just play music. And I was like, you know, people come up and ask me, well, "What do you do?" Be like, "I'm a musician." Be like, "No, what do you do?" Be like, "I live out of my fucking car <laughs> and I play music." Right. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. That that's hardcore. Yeah, I, I didn't last longer than my twenties. <laughs> <laughs> but were after you a while, the back the starts giving out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you were content at the time, though, right? It was. I mean, look at, at the time. I was happy as a pig in mud doing it. You know, I thought I was the man. I was like, yeah, I was like, all I'm doing is playing music, and I'm you know living. Wow, crazy. Off, off topic the river. question. <laughs> off topic question. Where the hell did you shower? I'm, I'm sorry, I missed that one. Where did you shower? Oh, where did I shower? 
What is it, the hair? I, I am very conceited about no, my No, 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 not now, when you were living in your car. Oh! Oh, yeah, I guess oh, the hair Chris didn't is not judging you now. Although I'm not judging you now. He could be. Sh- I'm not asking you if you showered. I'm asking uh, you, when I you mean, lived in your car, where did you shower? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I've become more of a rocker as I've gotten older, but I, I still hang on to some of my hippie ways. Um, showering has never been a major uh, stopping point in the Dave Subert Express. But... <laughs> Um, you know, I, I do it a lot more nowadays, I guess, <laughs> particularly in the summer. But, uh, yeah, no, I, 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 you know, just wasn't a thing. Nice. I swam in the East River. What else do you think I did? I mean, I, you know, I felt like that would be worse. I felt like my own body sweat would probably be better than the East River. But I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll key you into a little bit, I guess. I, I didn't really tell a lot of people this, but it's sometimes I used to sleep under the Long Beach Pier. And, uh, you know, I just jump into the ocean, right, you know, in the morning, like, buck-ass naked, you know, before any, you know, basically all the surfers are out there and shit. Yeah. I was probably there. I used to go to the Long Beach Pier all the time. No way. Yeah. On, on, on Long Island? Yeah. You yeah, I used to take the there. railroad out there. I was probably sleeping underneath you. <laughs> Jesus. That's what that smell was then. <laughs> <laughs> Me and the rest of the guys hanging out there. <laughs> I was the only one playing. How did, we, music how did we get here? Uh, yeah. I'm not. I'm not sure. He thought. He thought I asked him if he showered. Yeah. We tend to go off the rails quite often. That's okay. It's, it makes for a better interview. <laughs> it, 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 this is one of the most fun interviews I think I've ever had. This is great. It's better than how did you get your band name? Yeah. Yeah. No offense, but we don't care. Yeah, I don't know. So because I mean, honestly, when people ask me that question, I wasn't in the band at the time, so I always got to like, just kind of make something up. Yeah, we don't <laughs> care at all. We're more. So how long? Practicing. How long have you been in the band then? I've been in since 2019. So um, before me, they had a few guys kind of in between. Um, I guess that um, yeah, I don't, I don't want to say anything in the past. I guess I've said stuff that upset those guys in between, but I guess things just didn't really work out. And the guy prior to that was this guy, Ernie. And, they, you know, they had a lot of success with Ernie. Um, and that's where most of, you know, the the previous albums and stuff were, were from. Uh, but, I, you know, they, fantastic band. I was just kind of doing my own thing in another band at the time. And um, it was, you know, doing, had a decent amount of success as well in the vinyl plane. But, uh, yeah, I, that the vinyl plane was ending around then. And they were in search of a new singer around then. And it just kind of all fell into place. This guy, Billy Cahood who is the singer from Grimjack, was based on Long Island. And uh, he knows both Scott and me and put us together, and the rest is history. Nice. So you joined in 2019, and then 2020 hits. Were you just like, what the fuck, man? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, along with the <laughs> entire rest do. of the country, sure. Right. But, yeah. <laughs> or the world, I guess. But yeah, um, it, it was, uh, yeah, it was frustrating because we were we were getting a lot of momentum, and then all of a sudden, and you know, it it just was pulled like a rug pulled right under our feet. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do this sob story like everybody has for the pandemic because we all had a lot of stuff we had planned. But um, yes, I will say it was absolutely a motivating motivation crusher. But the band did really well. We pivoted well. We did great moves during the pandemic. We didn't let it get get us down. And I think we rose up because of it. I think that's the sign. That's that's an answer I've been waiting to hear. Because I asked oh. this quote periodically this comes up. And everyone's like, yeah, it fucking sucked. And it's always very negative. You really turned that into a positive situation. Yep. Well, Maybe that was what we were, yeah, we were trying to. Hey! Sorry, I got dogs out here. Do not hurt her. <laughs> ah, ah. Sorry. <laughs> I was trying to say, like, I wasn't doing that, but that's what I've been looking down at every once. <laughs> we good? <laughs> yeah, we're good. Are you at Everyone the dog safe? park? No, no, no. I'm just in the backyard just watching a couple boxers if you want to. There they are right there. Oh, no, that's cool. I thought you were at a dog park or something. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> that was in the morning. What do you guys have planned next? Are you taking this out on the road? Yeah, so I mean, we've been on the road for for I guess since Gramercy. So we did um we did like a secret show right before that at Lucky Thirteen because we weren't allowed to like you know play anywhere before that and whatnot. We didn't want to you know ruin any fan base and whatnot on on the on the level of that we were we were not the headliner. We were the uh, main support, so we also wanted to make sure we were doing right by them. Um, so we played Lucky Thirteen right before that. When we played Gramercy uh, the fifteenth of July, 
And then since then we've been kind of on the road. We did um we did Artie's uh Barn Grill in Frenchtown, New Jersey, and that was opening for Texas Hippie Coalition, which we've yeah. done before out there. That yeah, was a great gig. Um we're we're loving that. It's the third time we've been to that spot. We're starting to develop a really good fan base out there. We're love it out there. The fans are great. Um it's like right on the border of like uh PA and Jersey right there. Right. And after that, just uh, just this last weekend, we did uh, Worcester, Massachusetts. We never played there before. Honestly, I really never knew much about Worcester. My brother lived in uh, Boston or a suburb of Boston in Quincy for a while, but never knew really anything about Worcester. Holy crap, what an awesome rock scene they got. We played That's this where the place Palladium ball. is at, right? Yeah, the Palladium's there, but we played this place off the rails, which is like down the block from the Palladium. And it was incredible. We played with Blacktop Mojo. It was, I mean, those guys are just amazing. We love humbled to be playing with them man it was just fantastic open with for them but um i mean this this place was just awesome it's an old restaurant that they just added this like giant warehouse to the back of it and it's super nice venue with great lighting great sound i was like wow um and we it's just like one of the better venues or one of the better shows i've had like ever and it was just like a, a kind of an add-on um that our manager kyle got us thank you kyle um <laughs> and it was a great show and then we uh did newfoundland pa just sunday um for like a little outdoor festival at this place renegade saloon mm -hmm. and uh we'll be going back to jersey uh friday for dingbats um okay yeah and then we'll be doing you know, um i'm you know, oh, sorry you know what i find interesting the east coast of the united states has so many great venues right live music is alive and well on the east coast of the united states yes on the west coast not so much. Everything's shut down. There's not a lot of live music venues there. Why? Yeah, I don't, I, I gotta say, I don't really know. Um, I haven't been out west in a while. I lived in San Diego in like 2016, 20, yeah, 2015, something like that. It was a little before my marriage. And um, and yeah, I, I mean, the, the scene was a little healthier back then, I guess, but um, it's um you know i'm I'm still getting you know we, we got some offers for uh, like uh the go-go -Go and the holding company in um san diego or the go-go in la um but yeah I, i'm i'm hearing that and i haven't experienced it yet but i have heard that it's, it's really kind of going down out there and i'm you know disappointed to hear that like like i grew up in vancouver canada but you know right next to seattle like an hour and a half drive that place there used to be live music venues from from like portland to vancouver you could do like a tour for days going through that area because there's so many venues there's nothing left it's, yeah it's sad well i mean i i can kind of empathize on the new york side i guess with that i mean there's definitely we've, we've had a major loss um we've definitely lost a lot you know things are still going down but there's definitely big venue loss here um i know the city really kind of held on to a lot of stuff which i was i was shocked but happy yeah um i, I really thought we were going to lose more but i know where i'm from on long island long island got kind of crushed we lost a major van like this place revolution was really kind of a crushing blow yep. and how many a lot of people right? yeah that was um that was a big like like small venue that got in some national acts and stuff and now there's really you know it wasn't a live nation venue but it kind of like made long island a little more relevant Right. And now all you have is, um, I mean, the Coliseum's done. So you really, besides Jones Beach, which is seasonal, you have the Paramount, and there's no other Live Nation venue. You still have the Amity View Music Hall, though, right? Yeah, AMH is there. I, I wouldn't. That's definitely not Live Nation, though. Um, okay. the, the, across the street, you have the Warehouse, which is uh, same owner as 89 North, and uh, was the owner of KJ Farrell's before that closed. So KJ were you a, were you a Sundance one. guy? I... My ex-wife was a Sundance guy. I'm a little too young for Sundance. Okay. Um, I, I, I hang out with that crew. I'm just a little younger. Yeah, I grew up going to Sundance. I like Sundance. I mean, I, I definitely... I, I am probably friends with a lot of people you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That brings me to the end of my questions. Chris, you got anything else? Yeah, me, me too. This is a great interview. Thanks for putting up with us. Ah, you guys are awesome. I hope my partner didn't insult you too much. Well, and get insulted at all, out. man. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm a pretty easygoing guy, man. I, I and I kind of embrace the fact that I don't shower, so I'm cool with that. <laughs> yeah, we got so many sound bites for this bad boy. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love sound bites. Let's throw them all out there. <laughs> we did an interview a little bit before you. Chris wasn't in it. It was our other partner, Rena, from Finland. And in the middle of the interview, we were talking to the guys in Sewin. 
And in the middle of the interview, she starts telling us a story about her son, her seven-year-old son, finding her vibrator under the couch and using it as a microphone to sing in the living room. Holy crap. <laughs> so glad I don't have children. <laughs> I wasn't expecting oh. that at all. Rena's wide open and it just became this like weird thing. <laughs> That's great. I can see it happening. <laughs> I wish I was on that interview. <laughs> <laughs> wait, 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 your son did what? <laughs> He's singing Eye of the Tiger. <laughs> Who just leaves that thing out? No, it's- I'm sorry. I'm done. I'm done. We all know kids. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Well. Anyway, before we go, uh, first, if you could just tell us where fans can find you guys at. Absolutely. You can always find us at www.10tonmojo.com, but we are all over the internet, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that stuff. And always make sure you check out the stream us at Spotify, YouTube, everywhere streaming music is released. That's all I've got, my friend. Thank you so much. Thank you. You guys are awesome. Have a great one. You Take too. care, cheers. my friend. Be well. Free to ring. All right. Cheers. <laughs> All right. Bye. Peace. Ever wonder what a punch from Elton John feels like? Or how you cope with having turned down the chance to be in Nirvana? Or what signal Keith Richards gives when he wants you to get the hell out of his hotel room? Fans of Too Much Effie Perspective don't have to wonder, because they've heard these exact stories and a jillion others on our podcast. I'm Alex Hoffman, former tour manager for Radiohead. And I'm musician and comedy writer Alan Keller. On the TMEP show, we get guests like Nancy Wilson from Heart, Jeremiah Freights from the Lumineers, and Modern Family's Julie Bowen to tell us things they may have only shared with their therapist, clergy, or a TMZ stringer. So join us on Too Much Effing Perspective. That's E-F-F-I-N-G Perspective. The only podcast you crank up to 11. Oh.